Hey, what's up everyone? How are you all doing today? My name is Jordan McCracken Foster and I am a teaching artist here at ArtProf. And I'm here today with Clara Lou. And what we'll be focusing on today is drawing clothing, specifically the spiral fold. So if you guys are learning, are interested in learning how to turn your artistic weakness into your strength, check out our website at artprof.org where we have lots of free resources like tutorials, critiques, art dares, and all that good stuff. So Clara, why don't you get us into the mode of drawing clothing for today? This is our finale, you guys. Jordan and I have gone through all these different fold types, and today we're gonna go over the spiral fold. But before that, we're going to do a quick review of the different types of fold types so we can start breaking that down because you know what? You guys don't have any excuse now. You should have done your homework by now and understood all of these concepts. So Jordan, what is the pipe fold? Uh, the pipe fold is when you have a, a cylindrical object, like a weight, like the waist or something like that, and you have compressed fabric at the top, and then it creates these pipe-shaped uh, folds going down. This is probably the easiest one. I think it tends to be the less dynamic out of the ones that we've seen. For example, we have the moving fold, which is just like, bah! <laughs> it's all over the place. You don't know what's going on, but it's very expressive and good for capes. Yes, always good for capes. Or if you're on the red carpet, that works too. <laughs> yeah, well, that, yeah, Lupita was just was just showing off in that last one. <laughs> well, wouldn't you? If I had a dress like that, I would oh, do that. Oh, oh, if I were her, I totally would. I'm just saying the obvious. She's totally showing off because she's so glamorous, you know. <laughs> she's <Of course>. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then of course, Doctor Strange. I was thinking, Jordan. I really should buy this movie. I don't own it. I, I still haven't seen it, so. <laughs> <sighs> oh my God, I'm never gonna let you live that down. <laughs> okay, me? now we have Who the... Avatar? <laughs> huh? Excuse me, Miss Who Hasn't Seen Avatar? Fine, <laughs> one for one, you know? Okay. okay, now we have the diaper fold, which is modeled here by Zendaya. We also have Lucy Liu and Laverne Cox. And we also have the dead fold, which is very dramatic and a pain in the butt for a lot of us. I think last time we realized that a lot of people had trouble with it, but that's why it's actually a great fold to work on. And we have a question from W315 who says, is this a draw along? Yes, it is. So we're gonna just do a couple of brief slides to explain the spiral fold, and then we'll get into some drawing in a little bit. And Jordan, tell us about the half lock fold. What's going on there? So the half lock fold is uh, some is a fold that only comes on a cylindrical object like an arm or a leg, and it creates this kind of you know L shape or this kind of diagonal you know triangle shape right where the joint is, so the elbow or the knee. And actually, it was kind of perfect that we did this drawing for the half lock because it was a nice segue into the zigzag fold. So Jordan, how would you explain the zigzag fold? Uh, zigzag fold, fold again takes place on a cylindrical object like an arm or a leg and it literally is just, you know, zigzags or diamond shapes all over the, the clothing. And, and also, by the way, for those who have not been tuning in, uh, the, the thickness of the fold does depend on the fabric and uh, the way it's bending too. So even though you'll see the same principles applied, it might look very different uh, compared to something else, like if it's silk versus cotton or something like that. Yeah, like if you guys look at this photo of Naomi Osaka, she's wearing this like bright pink blazer. But then Michael Jackson, <laughs> when he was five years old, is wearing this like purple leather jacket. And you can see that the zigzag fold, it's a lot more pronounced. It's more three-dimensional, more sculptural. And so depending on the type of fabric, the same fold can actually appear very differently. And so that's another factor to be considering. Okay, let's talk about the spiral fold. Jordan, what's going on here? 
Uh, spiral fold is also on a cylindrical object, like an arm or a leg. And usually uh, you'll see it a lot on like tire forming clothing. And it's basically where it just creates a spiral shape, you know, like uh, like that barbershop mm -hmm. sign just goes in the spiral. And that that's about as complex as it gets. <laughs> So Jordan and I have been talking a lot about coming to America because if you guys didn't know, the sequel just came out. And yes, I did watch it already with my daughter. Coming to America is like her hands down favorite comedy. So I've watched that movie like 5,000 times. So of course we had to watch the sequel the second it came out. But apparently Jordan McDowell's has a lot of spiral folds. <laughs> yep, yep. Got to advertise, got to advertise properly. So yeah, Akeem has the best spiral folds in, <laughs> in the shot. It's just so perfect. Like not usually you only see it on like one arm at a time, but he's see, you're seeing them both here. And I just, I can picture this scene. It's so funny for those who haven't seen I it. Mean, I think we should have a competition for who can recite more lines <laughs> from this movie. Oh, I haven't seen it in years, but I'd be down. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is one of my favorite scenes because he's trying to impress Lisa right. and he comes in to take out the garbage and he says, when you think of garbage, think of Hakeem. Right. <laughs> that was the best. Love it. Okay. We also have another shot of the dad. I think his name is Cleo. And this is like spiral full party. It's mm -hmm. awesome. I was like, thank you very much, McDowell's, for giving me all your spiral folds. <laughs> Okay, we also have spiral folds in Hellenistic Greece. Isn't this so cool, you guys? Look at this. This is hardcore spiral folds. Now, Jordan, usually you see it on the arm, but you do see it on the leg, actually, now and then. Yeah, it, it's all about if it's a cylindrical object or not. And I think because we tend to wear you know, pants and jeans a lot more, you might not see it so much. So it's more common on arms, but in a time like Hellenistic Greece where there's like lots of skirts or like silk flowy clothing and stuff that would totally appear a lot more and it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Seven Angelic says it's mostly about imagining where the tension of a fabric is, where does it pinch and where does it hang loose? Yes, absolutely. And again, depending on the fabric, if you have silk, there's oftentimes not a lot of tension. If you have a pair of jeans, that's a much stiffer piece of fabric. And so the folds are gonna be a little bit easier to notice. All right, you could have it on the head actually. Like, don't you think this is weird that it's on a head? Yes, because it, it gives, it, it. I get the feeling of really dark <laughs> images when I think of something placed over the head like that. So yes. <laughs> well, this one's a little bit less upsetting than your typical head covered <laughs> with yeah. fabric that you usually see in a movie. <laughs> now, here's what's very interesting about the spiral fold is that oftentimes it merges with the zigzag fold. Sometimes it merges with the half lock fold. And so it's actually sort of rare that you will see a spiral fold totally in isolation. So can you explain how that works, Jordan? Uh, I will try. Uh, well, so when when you have that cylindrical object, like you mentioned before, there's opportunity for things to shift depending on the fabric, depending on your position, the way you're bending your arm or something. And so any one of those three can show up. And in some rare cases, you will find all three types of fold spiral, zigzag, and uh, half lock in that position. Um, you, you just have to know what to look out for. Um, what we're trying to provide is the signs to know when to recognize these folds, but you could find them in any number of combinations. Yeah, and what you guys will start to notice is that ultimately all the folds do that. They all connect somehow. It's just the spiral and the zigzag. Thank you, Benedict, for modeling the spiral fold. And look at the pipe fold on the right-hand side. This film, Tell me in the chat, who here saw 12 Years a Slave? It was in 2013. I think it won Best Picture or something like that. But this movie has like every fold. Like, I don't know what it is about the colonial era, but they just have a lot of spiral folds. And so I ended up pulling tons of stills from this film because there's quite a bit of that. And so here we have half lock that is being 
covered by the spiral fold. And uh, guess who's in this movie, Jordan? I, I actually, I don't know who that is. <laughs> Come on, it's Michael Fassbender. You don't recognize him by now? Not with the beard. <laughs> well, he's kind of a horrible character in this movie. So I actually have only seen this movie once, despite him being in the movie. And also Bennett is in the movie. But it's such a hard movie to watch that I, was, I can't watch it just to like ogle these guys. <laughs> Yeah. But so I was very impressed by this pose, Jordan, because check this out. We have spiral fold, zigzag, pipe, and diaper. Okay, this is like a world record. <laughs> Just missing two. That's all we're missing. Oh, crap. Two or three. I wish but... I could find one that had all of them. Yeah. Well, to be fair, I think four is rare to find in general on the same subject. So I think you're doing just fine. I think you found a diamond in the rough here. <laughs> or lightning in the bottle, I guess I should say. <laughs> Amara says, Clara, this has helped bring life to my fashion drawing. So thank you so much to you and Jordan. Now my part-time work improved and I've leveled up. That's awesome. I'm so excited to hear that because this is one of those things that I just don't think a lot of people focus on clothing because oftentimes when people do figure drawing, they want to draw the nude, they want to know the anatomy. But then Jordan, when you start doing character design, you're like, uh, yeah, I got to do this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. I think both should be learned at, you know, if not the same time, then I would put, I put figure drawing slightly before clothes figure drawing, but they need to be learned in, you need to develop those at the same time because most opportunities you're going to have to draw people are not going to be when they're naked. So <laughs> um, I think you're probably going to need to get used to drawing clothing on them. Well, and it's not something that gets taught in art class very much. Like you're sort of the only person I know who's actually taken a class on how to draw clothing. Yeah. There was no class like that when I was an undergrad in art school. So it's actually, it was great for me to do this series for that reason alone. Yeah, it's tough. If you don't know what to draw, if you don't know how you're gonna approach it, I, I really think that you're gonna have to sit down and teach it to yourself because it's so essential, especially if you plan to be drawing the figure or any form of fabric in general. It doesn't even have to be a character. It could be, you know, bed sheets. You know, you don't understand these types of folds or, or drapery then it's not going to work for you. All right, Jordan, what are you starting with today? Prince Akeem and Ben <laughs> Oh, man. I haven't seen this movie in so long, but I, I miss it. When we were talking about it before the stream, I was like, oh, I need to, I need to check it out again because it's just a classic. So tell us in the chat who here has seen Coming to America and... I'm not even gonna ask if you think it's funny because you're crazy if you don't think it's funny. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. And I did give Jordan one little spoiler. It doesn't really matter with the plot, but I'm not gonna give you guys any spoilers. You'll just have to watch the sequel yourself. Yeah, I'm only gonna be able to talk about the original one, but maybe this would be a good time to talk about some of our favorite scenes from the movie. <laughs> from oh the my God. Um, There's too many. Yeah. Well, one that just pops in my mind right now is in the very first movie when um, when Lisa, or not Lisa, I'm sorry, when the original queen is walking down and the guy just bursts out in song. He stands there all <laughs> stuck. He's like, Jeez! <laughs> <laughs> And he just sings the whole song in silence, off key and everything. It is so funny. And then when he finishes, He's he has like this hot this big note and he's like ah. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that. It's so well, great. the thing about that movie is you can't just watch it once because you miss out on all the like little hidden jokes. Have you noticed that? Uh, I'm not sure. I've watched it too many times to realize whether or not a joke is hidden or not. <laughs> so well. Like, there's a lot of little jokes about the fashion, like that silly little gold medal face that that guy's wearing when he sings the song is just, it just makes it more hilarious. Oh, I, I'm not sure. I have to, 
I literally I haven't watched the movie in years, so I have to remember. But yeah. So this is a good one, Jordan. RB Dick says when his <clears throat> wife he's supposed to marry starts barking like a dog. <laughs> She's like, barf, barf, a big dog. <laughs> <laughs> What is your favorite food? Whatever it is you like. <laughs> it was hilarious. I'm gonna start crying of laughter on this. Like seriously. Oh my gosh. So are you gonna draw both of them, Jordan? I think so. I'm gonna start with Akeem, but I think I'll draw both. Um haven't this is my first time drawing today. I haven't had a chance to warm up, so hopefully he's come out all right. But uh well, guys, I'm doing something very daring today. I am using colored pencil, and then I'm going to do a little bit of watercolor, and then I'm going to do some colored pencil over the watercolor, because I think it'd be fun for you guys to see what the possibilities are. I'm just going to eat You going to do any color today, Jordan? Uh, I don't know. Um, I I never think about color when I'm doing these streams usually, but the, the feeling strikes me if it makes them look more royal, maybe. <laughs> I'm just thinking because, you know, we got some of that complimentary color action in Akeem's purple, I mean, blue and orange. That is true. That is true. Maybe. You know, you got to be a good role model, Jordan. Is that what makes me a good role model? Okay, I, I'll, I'll I don't know. <laughs> I thought I had to do a little bit more, but if I just need to pick the right colors to be a good role model. Yeah. That's it, that's all you gotta do. Yeah. <laughs> You're all set. Let's see, what, I think what other scenes are my favorites of? I just like when they show up at the airport with like, 50 bags and suitcases and they like toss it all in the cab. <laughs> oh yeah. That was great. In the rose puddles. And now like yes, yes. Hey, with those rose puddles in my son Akeem, you will be banished from the camp. And they just walk out the door. <laughs> scared. <laughs> you know, that's a lot of rose puddles if you think about it. Yeah. Oh, okay. I just have another hilarious one. At the very beginning, where Akeem just wakes up, he's all smiling, he's like, I forget the guy's name, uh, the character. He's like, it is my 21st birthday. Do you think I, for this one time I could use the bathroom by myself? <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, most amusing, sir. Wipers! <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so funny, Jordan. Maria says, in my country, they called coming to America a prince in New York. Oh, interesting. That is so funny. You know, that happens pretty often where movies have one title in one country and then they translate it to something really weird in another language. That would that would throw me off. I would be so confused, honestly. Well, the title really does change the way you think about the movie. Yeah. A Prince New York versus I mean it, it's not wrong <laughs> at all. It's definitely not wrong. It's different. Oh no, but it makes you think about the movie a little differently. Yeah. You know, apparently, um, I just found this out maybe like a week ago, but there was actually gonna be a TV show based on the movie. Do you know that? Oh, really? Yeah, it, they filmed the pilot in like 1988 and it actually was starring um, Tommy Davidson as a key. They couldn't get Eddie Murphy for some reason. I guess too expensive at that point. And then they right. had the guy who said, Why brothers? Like, whatever his name is, he went to America with him. And they only made a pilot, but it was just not funny. It was not funny at all. <laughs> Apparently, Eddie Murphy didn't even show up on the set, not a single time. And um, there's only like a couple of random clips you can find online. But I saw uh, a YouTuber reviewing it. Uh, like the other week, and I was like, huh, like, no wonder I never knew. They only made one episode. It sucked. I don't even think they aired it. You, you know, it was like on the back of a DVD somewhere. The but, uh, only movie that got turned into a TV show that I think worked was Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Oh, I've never even seen Buffy. Um, what? 
vampires aren't my thing. <laughs> I really okay. Do. Especially because I mean, mine, that show that that was out in the late nineties. I was like three or four, so. That's true. That's not exactly viewing for a four-year-old. Right. But at that time, I was like, where's my Sesame Street at? Where's Elmo? Need my Elmo. <laughs> you know, or, or what else would I, would I watch at three and four? Hercules, Tarzan, you know, that type of stuff. Let's see. Kathleen has seen the sequel. Didn't really like it. I mean, it was okay, but everything felt rushed in the movie. That's true. I totally agree with that. There are a couple scenes where you're like, really? That's it. <laughs> Nothing else is going to happen. But you know, I wonder why they made the sequel. You know, because it's like it's been thirty freaking years, <laughs> or thirty-two years, or something, and it just doesn't. Like, I think we all would love to see those characters again, but sometimes things are just better left in the minds of the people. I think, and just as a classic, you know. They are, but I think when you like know you're going to make a lot of money, I think it's hard for them to step away from that opportunity. You know, because it's like a guaranteed audience. Like I knew the sequel was going to be bad, but I still watched it, right? Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, but to be fair, Eddie Murphy in the 80s was an absolute genius too. So, Oh my God, he is like... <sighs> Shasta says, I'm glad for so much content about rendering clothing. Plus, you always make it a good time. You know, it should be a good time. Being an artist should not always be about angst and pain. Yeah, I agree. I don't think art needs to be about angst. I mean, unless that's what you want to do. There are some, you know, kind of creepy, dark art type stuff. But it should be fun. No, but I guess I'm thinking, like like the making of it, like you can be making angsty work and be having fun, right? Yeah, that's true. Have you heard of a show called Invader Zim? Oh yeah, yeah, my kids used to watch that all the time. That's a perfect example of a show. I love it. I think it's hilarious, but it's so like weird and twisted. Um, like, like they had a whole episode um, where like this, the alien character Zim had a boil, and it for some reason hypnotized humans, and you oh. never understood why. <laughs> but it just started hypnotizing people, and so he he puts him in a suit. He like literally has a suit hanging from his boil on his face, and he's like, "This is Postulio," and he just starts yeah. hypnotizing people. <laughs> oh. It's gross, but it's like amazing at the same time. <laughs> I kind of love that. Yeah. He drew a face on it, too. I got to say that. He drew a face on it. That's very impressive. <laughs> so, Jordan, you know what I just did? Hmm. I just stopped myself from dipping my brush into my coffee. Oh, I've done that. I barely, barely caught myself. <laughs> One time I was eating, and I almost drew with my graham cracker and ate my pencil. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. That's so good. Oh, my God. I love that. Yeah. Oh man, it's been a while since I've done watercolor. Do you like watercolor? Uh, it's okay. I, I struggled with it. Um, it's one of those things that uh, is just is just tough for me. Do this. I always hated it, and then I got into ink wash, which is not that different. I mean, it, it is different for sure, but. I think ink wash helped me get over my fear. And then I shot those tutorials of painting with watercolor in Utah. And then I was like, okay, Clara, you need to, you need to do this. This is kind of dumb that you've been avoiding watercolor your whole life. I took a class with on watercolor when I was still at RISD. Um, yeah. And uh, it, it was, it was really tough. I, the biggest issue for me was learning to just let it go and having enough paint on the brush because when i would layer stuff things would get washed up and i couldn't figure out how to, how to get that together and my teacher he's so good everything he did just looked like magic to me ah. and really frustrating that's so frustrating like you know it's like you're trying so hard and somebody else is like and it's like 
awesome. <laughs> right. I mean, I didn't feel too bad because he's also been doing it for like 20 something years. And if you do something for 20 something years and you're not good at it, I feel like you're doing it very incorrectly. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. He's a great guy, though. Do you think it was really annoying to have like John Singer Sargent in your art class? Uh, Just picture being oh. in art class with like John Singer Sargent. Do you think you would be like so depressed? I would be. I would be depressed and then I'd try and be his friend so that I could learn. Oh, see, that's such a like positive attitude. I'd be like, screw that guy. Well, here's this is my mentality on it. It's like clearly this guy's better than me. And we're gonna be competing. And I think it would be the wisest decision to become his friend so he could look so we could look out for each other and I can learn off of it. You know, it just uh I think it's it's an easier way to get through life. <laughs> you know, when you put it that way, that probably is more productive, but uh I don't always think like that, Jordan, <laughs> when it comes to being jealous. <laughs> I get this iconic mustache here. I don't know why his mustache was, way, was so thick. But. Lisa says, sometimes Jordan alters a wrinkle from the reference. I presume to improve the drawing. I'd like to hear how it improves the drawing. I wish I knew which wrinkle you were talking about. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> basically, what I do is um, some, sometimes a wrinkle will end up making someone look a lot older or um than they are like for example babies sometimes have little wrinkles i do my best to not show those because suddenly they'll look like demon babies you know they'll just look <laughs> old and young at young and old at the same time and it's creepy um so in a situation where i remove a wrinkle like that that's usually what i'm thinking about like is this getting across the same way um and i pick and choose from my reference you know i don't do I don't have to do everything the exact same way. It just really depends. And in some cases, I just may not notice that I did that and I'm just going on autopilot. So that's another explanation too. <laughs> Probably not the most helpful. But <laughs> well, I think maybe what it comes down to is just not feeling like you're being controlled by your reference. Right. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I feel like that's, something that I would fall victim to. I would just become a slave to my reference and it just wouldn't, it wouldn't always produce the best results, you know, and it stops you from having fun sometimes. Um, and, and you have to learn to pick and choose. I think that's a really good um, thing to start practicing is like when something is going to, when something is necessary in the drawing versus when you can kind of make that up. Like for example, this has to be a half lock fold because no other fold will be here. I put a pipe fold, that makes no sense. And I'm talking about this corner or the elbow. But um, yeah, that's what I would say. Well, and also I find it stressful to have to look that carefully. It's just too much work. <laughs> Maybe it all comes down to laziness, I don't know. Right, and, and oftentimes that kind of detail will often make the drawing work. Um, so it's just, uh, a lot of it's preference and person and taste and just the style that I draw. Um, but yeah. And I do also think you guys, it's actually harder to pick what to draw as opposed to drawing everything that you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cause that causes you to be decisive. Well, yeah, you have to say, hey, out of everything I'm looking at in this reference photo, what is actually going to be the most important? Like, what can I afford to not paint? And what really is getting to the point here? Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Oh, I'm having so much fun with this background. <laughs> I feel like I'm having more fun with the background than the clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I just want to shout out uh, Hisoteric for the $50 super sticker. Thank you so much. Really appreciate your support. You are awesome. 
This might be one of those Guys. I don't get through all the characters. <laughs> <laughs> You guys, every contribution you make is so important to us. It's incredibly helpful. That way we make sure that our content stays free because there's so many people who just can't take an art class because maybe they live far away and there's no opportunity or maybe it costs too much. I mean, Jordan, do you ever wonder, like if you were born today, okay, Mm -hmm. And you had access to what people have access now to the internet. Don't you feel like you would be a different artist? Oh, totally. I am constantly seeing artists who are like 13 and their skills are amazing. Like, I'm like, what in the world? And my classmates or my former classmates and people who are my age were like, what the heck is up with these kids? Like, we don't understand. And then I go like, well, we didn't have access. To, we didn't have like art tutorials on YouTube the same way we were 16, 17. Like, there's just a huge gap. Um, I so it would have totally changed the game for better or for worse, honestly. But uh, I definitely know it would have made an impact. Well, Jordan, you probably had some YouTube stuff. I mean, definitely not what people have now. But did you watch tutorials as a kid? Yeah, totally. Um, I there was only a couple, there were only a handful when I was applying to school, though. I only know about maybe two or three channels. And, mm -hmm. and they would update sporadically. And the other thing is, a lot of professionals weren't doing it. It was very oh, okay. professional tutorial, um, and you would often find, you know, I don't want to be rude, but you know, amateur artists, which isn't a problem. But I would much rather get most of my tips from someone who's in the industry or in the field that I want to right. study. Um, just, you know, just like anything else, you know, I don't want to hear someone else. If I want to become a plumber, I don't want to hear, you know, some amateur's ideas on plumbing. I'm like, no, I don't want to destroy my house. I need to be <laughs> professional. I need you to tell me, like, what's that's the real deal. Um, so. Yeah. Well, and also you guys have heard me say this before, being a good artist and being a good teacher, they're not always skills that come together. You, you can be an amazing artist, but maybe you don't have any classroom experience or you've never had to write a curriculum before. So it's, it's not the same thing exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See that being a challenge. But I can't change it. I, I, I learned the way I learned, and uh, it's okay. <laughs> well, this is an interesting comment from B Dog Boos, who says, I'm glad there wasn't such an online community when I was little. I would have been overstimulated and less creative. That's such a good point, because I know a lot of students <clears throat> who are applying to art school, they get really intimidated and frustrated seeing other art school portfolios and it makes them feel like, oh, I'm not any good and I'm not gonna get in. So, I mean, there's definitely a negative side to that, right? Oh yeah, I I remember actually being that age and wanting to find videos of people's portfolios and they just weren't out, you know, in 2012. Oh. They just didn't, I don't even think they existed at that point. Um, you were lucky. scoured the internet for them. Now they're super popular, but I remember, I know someone who even got into the school that they wanted to get into and made a video like that and uh, still said how intimidating it was because they see all these other artists and they're really good. Um, but one thing I noticed about young artists is that they often, over, they put a little too much pressure on themselves a lot of times and they don't, yeah. see, they don't see their skill over for what it actually is. Because a lot of people need like some guidance just naturally, but there's a lot of them who are really, really good. And most times I'm like, dang, you're better than I was when I was your age. You know, I don't know what you're worried about. <laughs> so. Oh, I see that all the time. Like I look at these poor, I'm like, I was not that good when I was that age. So <laughs> yeah. Same but that's such a good point because I, I do think that maybe it was a good thing that when I was, applying to art school, I didn't know what anybody else was doing. Like, I really had no idea. Like, the only people I could measure myself against were the kids at my school. And I was like one of two kids who went to art school. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think. It was, I think I was the only one who went to art school in my year, too. Um, yeah. Oh, also want to shout out Joey Ross de Chavez. Thank you so much for the super chat. We appreciate you.
And let's see, Vishaka says, yep, no art classes. And it's pretty difficult to get in one seeing the background and studies I did is totally different. It's, I think it's hard to control in terms of the quantity of what's available now, because I think that's now the problem. Like your problem, Jordan, was that there wasn't enough stuff. And now I think there's so much stuff that people don't know where to go. Yeah, there's a lot of terrible advice. I, I tend to, when I'm bored and I'm working, I tend to watch just random art videos and I won't name names or anything like that, but there are times where I've been like, that's terrible advice. And yeah, I know. I hope too many people aren't taking that seriously because that's either something about it might be toxic or just like, it's a slower way of achieving a certain goal. And um, it might be done, I'm pretty sure it's done out of ignorance, but there are a lot of times where I'm like, mm, I don't know if that's the best formula. But, you know, it is what it is. I think for me, the stuff that is more frustrating, I mean, yeah, like when sometimes people teach a technique and I'm like, uh, that's not really the best way or the most efficient way. But I think what's hard for me is when people say <clears throat> stuff like, this tutorial is for people with no talent. And I'm like, okay, that that's not nice, guys. <laughs> like, wow, I actually don't think I've heard that one. You've never seen that before. It's like, this video is for people who are terrible at drawing. And I'm like, I, I don't like that. I wouldn't either. Yeah, I don't think I've heard that one. I've cool. definitely seen stuff on my Facebook feed that has come up like that. Um, yeah, that's not, that's not what I would recommend. I don't think that's very nice. Unless there is sometimes where it can be engaging if it's in a sarcastic way. There's one YouTuber who's like, or there's actually a couple that are super sarcastic with their advice. And they're like, don't ever do underdrawings. Don't you ever do it. And it's like, <laughs> clearly, you know, the situations like that is a little different. <laughs> Look at Sean C says all the deviant art anime eye tutorials of my youth. Oh my god, oh, yeah. that's so funny. Well, you know what's interesting about anime is that, you know, it's fine if you like anime, but I know my daughter has been having a really hard time with her friends who like love anime. And she says that <clears throat> when they post images of anime, they get lots and lots of praise from their friends. And then when she posts like an original character, she doesn't get much reaction. And she finds it really frustrating because she feels like nobody appreciates what she does. And it's like so hard to see her struggle with that. Yeah, I can only imagine. Like, How, how old is, is she around? She's 11. I can only imagine how tough that is for an 11 year old to deal with. Cause oh. I, know, I know at my age, I first off wasn't nearly as, as good um, as, I, as I thought I was. But <laughs> dealing with the social pressure of life in general at age, um, uh, at age 11 and then dealing with the whole art side of things and wanting to get likes, that's gotta be really, really challenging. So yeah, that's, that's tough. I will say, and this. the thing is, she's not even on Instagram. Like, this is just stuff she shares in like a group DM. It's like, oh my god, there aren't even likes involved yet. Ugh. Oh wow. Okay, I didn't realize. Yeah. That. Let's see. Dara says. I had the same experience. It made me so mad. All the bad anime drawings that got sold on DeviantArt versus my original drawings. Yeah, and it's like, I try to explain to her, like, listen, the reason why people react that way is because it's familiar, they know it, they like the movies, and so of course they like it, but it's like, it still doesn't change the fact that she doesn't get much support or praise for doing original work, which ultimately is what, people get famous for most of the time. Yeah, it, it's, it's a balancing act because you have to ask yourself what you care about more. Is it improving or getting the likes? Now I'm sure you can have both at the same time, but it doesn't, I, I noticed that doesn't come until people are actually like professionals um, and, and they have a, a big following. 
or they can do like um, hyper realistic, you know, uh, drawings of photographs of you know famous people and stuff. Um, so. Well, one thing that does help her a little bit. I mean, I don't know if she's going to go to art school or anything. I mean, she has mentioned she's 11, you know, whatever. She's got plenty of time to think about it. But I say to her, I was like, listen, you know, when you apply to art school, the art schools, they don't want to see anime in the portfolio. Like, actually, they tell people don't put anime in the portfolio. And I think that's a little bit of like a very concrete example that I can point to where I'm like, okay, that's the scenario where doing anime isn't going to help you, even though you're struggling with this right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wonder what that's going to be in a couple of years because um, a lot of the opinion on anime is is slightly shifting too because more I think more people start to appreciate it. So I, yeah. I wonder how that's going to be in like 10, 15 years from now. That's true. I feel like anime has become more mainstream. Do you think that's true or am I just old? Oh, no, it's huge. It's, matter of fact, Sony just bought um, Crunchyroll, which is the anime... A subscription site for like one point three billion dollars or something like that. What? We just bought the entire catalog of Crunchyroll, and so Sony basically owns anime now. <laughs> so, oh my god! Keep in mind, Sony is also a Japanese company, but still, it's like <laughs> um, it, it, it's it's major. It, it can it is not something that can be ignored anymore. Yeah. Well, yeah, because I feel like when I was a kid, it, it was sort of like, oh, some people like this. It, it wasn't like it is now where you don't have to be embarrassed to like it. Like you, like in the 90s, people sort of thought you were a nerd or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nerds are winning now because we the biggest movies in the world are comic book hero movies or superhero movies. You know, Avengers. I mean, people have seen Avengers. <laughs> I didn't even, I never read an Avengers comic in my entire life and I will still go see the Avengers. You know, it's like, that's how big it's got. Yeah, this is a good comment from San K. Original creativity will win at the end of the day. Yeah, but you know what? It's hard to put your own stuff out there because I mean, why do you think there's a sequel to Coming to America? There's a built-in audience. Like they knew when they put out that sequel that people were totally gonna watch it. And the thing is like, you know, sometimes they remake these movies and I'm like, ah, uh, they're just trying to capitalize on the nostalgia. And I'm like, yep, worked on me. <laughs> Pretty much. But yeah, at, at the same time, part of it is uh, when you are a multi, million or multi-billion dollar company and you are trying to invest in the next big film there's a lot of risk involved giving an opportunity like that to someone who's brand new or to an idea that's brand new because no one knows oh, for sure and so there's a lot of shows like even like ne a lot of netflix animated shows they look original to us most of the time but a lot of those are based off of uh properties that came out a long time ago like voltron is based off of a show from the 80s uh, Carmen San Diego, that's based off a computer game. Uh, they, you know, there's there's a couple of others out there that are like that. And um, I mean, shoot, they just built Avatar Studios, which is based off of the Avatar franchise. They're going to make more movies and shows because they know that it's a successful franchise and people want to see it. So, yeah. Well, also, I think they think about age group because they're like, oh, people my age have kids now. And we'll make all of our kids watch the 80s stuff. So let's just yeah. release all the 80s stuff now. And it works. Right. Like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is still around. <laughs> like they, they constantly have stuff on there. Matter of fact, they had a show on Nickelodeon. Yeah, a few shows on Nickelodeon. And they're actually really cool looking. I actually need to check those out. But it's just how it is. Just how it be. You know what? I was going to put colored pencil over this, but now I sort of just want to do watercolor. Is that kind of weird? No, I think it's looking really good, actually. I like it. Yeah, you think I should skip the colored pencil? Yeah, just leave it. I really like the way you're doing, uh, I don't know what to call it. Is, is she wearing a robe? I can't really tell. <laughs> like, what is? She's wearing like a dress. A dress, okay. Tell me in the chat, who here thinks I should keep going with the watercolor. And who here wants to see me go in with the colored pencil? Because I don't know, it would be 
I mean, at least for detail stuff, it is really handy to have that. But also, I think a big part of watercolor is having good paper. And this is like awesome paper that I have right now. So it's making me really happy. <laughs> So Jordan, why did you take the watercolor class at art school, even though it was hard for you? Uh, well, one, I didn't know it was going to be hard for me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, that's number one. Let's get that across. Uh, second, uh, I always appreciated watercolor. I, it, it's always I, I like colors. I think anyone who knows me knows I like bright, saturated colors. I like just the variety of things you can get. Watercolor seemed like the perfect medium to be able to learn how to use it. The challenge mm. I had was just learning how to apply the medium. It took me the entire semester until I finally got a painting that I actually liked. Um, and I posted on my Instagram a long time ago. It's a, for those who feel like scouring through it. It's um, <laughs> it's like a, a seaside cliff and there's like a rock in the middle. And it's like green and orange and blue. But um, like all the other ones, I would I never posted those because I'm like, these suck. You know, <laughs> you know. See, I'm a little freaked out about doing the face in watercolor because the face is so small and I don't like doing super detailed stuff with watercolor, but I suppose this isn't really about the face. So maybe I have an excuse for yeah. the face to not look good. <laughs> yeah, the other reason I want to do watercolor is because Bill Watterson one of my favorites. Oh, really? Is that the inspiration for you? That was, now that I think about it, yeah, he was one of the inspirations. I, I always loved Calvin and Hobbes. And so when I saw like his backgrounds and stuff and the way he would do his covers, I was like, yeah, I could do this. And then I was like, maybe later. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that his watercolor work is severely underappreciated. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, I tried. And to... I'm sorry to say, I think it's because it's a comic. I think that's why it doesn't get the respect that it deserves. I one the, actually one of the reasons I love Bill Watterson is because he challenged that so much. Like, you know, his, his story about the Sunday pages, like how they wouldn't give him his space. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. The way he just would. So for those who don't know, Bill, you know, Calvin Hobbes. Um, on the Sunday pages, they, those would be the ones that always show up in the newspaper. And so what they would do is they'd say like the first two panels of the comic would often be cut for space. And so you'd have like a quick two panel gag and then the rest of the story. And Bill Watterson was like, no, screw that. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna make my comic in such a way where you can't take anything out. And so he would design his composition so that there's no way to remove anything. It, it, they were forced to print the whole thing. He's like, I'm, he's like my comics getting the respect it deserves and uh it was really awesome i love that i love that well did you ever read his 10th anniversary book where he has like notes under the comics about what he was thinking i have the full edition but i don't think i had that specific one uh, um i don't think go you could tell me anyway i'm sure <laughs> everyone else you should read it because he writes about all the like fights he had with his publisher and about syndication and like all the politics of it. It's just like really depressing to read about what you're up against. Mm. Yeah, all that behind the scenes stuff, which is, a, which is one of those reasons why like when people complain about shows um, and they're like, oh, the such and such season was so bad. And I was like, I always think like, you know, you don't really know what's going on behind the scenes. Like they're, might be a lot of uh executive you know control that the creators just aren't aren't able to beat or able to combat you know um because when people are paying you to make a show which is what happens like most creators they don't have millions of dollars to make an episode of their show so they go to a network like you know, right like a disney or a fox or well they're owned by the same company now but in, anyway and and <laughs> they give them millions of dollars and the person who gives you the millions of dollars has a lot of say um, in what's going to happen. So that ends up being the case for a lot of these stories. Well, Bill Watterson, I don't know if you knew this, but he refused to license Calvin and Hobbes. 
Mm -hmm. And people thought he was insane because like he could have made billions of dollars off the merchandising, but he refused because he said that once you see Calvin on a mug, it changes how you perceive the character. And he didn't want his characters being polluted by that, but his publishers were furious that he didn't want to do that because, you know, they lost so much money because he didn't want to license it. Right. Which is so awesome to me. It's like that artistic or integrity. I'm not saying that everyone should do that, but the, the value he put on artistic integrity and owning your creation is amazing. And like, to well, most people would not do that. Right. Right. And it, it's so cool. Like to this day, anytime you see a Calvin and Hobbes shirt, you know, someone made it up because it's, you won't find him on a shirt or a mug or a hop. You know how many people want Hobbes, you know, stuff, stuff, animal, especially. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I wanted a Hobbes. <laughs> um, Jordan, we have a question from Elizabeth. I don't know if this is a thing, but is it possible to use digital brushes in a watercolor way? Yeah, actually, they, um, I don't have them personally, but there are artists uh, who make watercolor brushes specifically for Procreate and for Photoshop. And I'm sure Clip Studio Paint as well. Um, I, I bring up this artist often because he's a friend of mine, Nicholas Cole. Uh, he has, he loves using watercolor and he has watercolor, or he has access to watercolor brushes. And if you go on his Instagram page, I'm sure you scroll down far enough, you can find exactly where he got them from. And it's really cool because I feel like they, um, you know how uh, watercolor will change as you paint it on? These have the exact same effect. So you'll paint it and it actually kind of dries while you're painting it digitally. It's really cool. Oh, whoa. That sounds so cool. Yeah. I've never used it, but it, it sounds awesome. Well, Elizabeth, if you go back, we did a stream with Adobe Fresco. It was me and Mia Roser. I don't know if I'm saying her name right. But anyway, she demonstrated a bunch of those watercolor brushes in Adobe Fresco. And they're weird, Jordan. They're sort of like sort of like animated watercolor strokes. Does that make any sense? Yeah, they're like live brushes. They act as if you were doing it live. It's it's bizarre. I don't know. I was like really distracted by it. Like I had trouble watching the mark and controlling it just because it was so weird. Yeah, I think Adobe Fresco is one of the first, if not the first, to try something like that. So that's probably what it was, too, just the novelty of it. Um, because now, you know, because there's a point where drawing digitally was just like, whoa, and now everyone's so used to it. But that is something that hasn't really been touched all that much. It's kind of untapped potential. So. Well, it's interesting that I think for a lot of kids now, they're more likely to have digital drawing experience than traditional. Tell me in the chat, who here feels that because you grew up when digital was available, that you're more comfortable with digital than traditional? Because I think that's starting to be the case now with a lot of the younger kids. I agree. Um, I still think that it's best to, to have a knowledge of using traditional tools before digital. Uh, for a wide variety, variety of reasons. Uh, but I totally, I mean, who doesn't have an iPhone or an, or an iPad or something? Very few people are kind of in that boat uh, in the grand scheme of things uh, for art. And so I can see how that would be a challenge. Well, plus Jordan, picture this. Imagine if you were five years old and somebody gave you an Apple Pencil. Do you really think you would not use that all day? Right, exactly, exactly. You know, I actually saw this video, just just for digital in general, I saw this video, uh, you know how little babies will wanna play with phones and stuff, cause it's like, oh, what's this bright thing? And so right, right. They, they took a phone case and put a, a block of styrofoam in it and they gave it to the baby so that she could just have it and she could smash it and do all the work. It was just styrofoam. <laughs> oh my God, that's hilarious. It was actually really cute. Well, I mean, babies sort of destroy everything. <laughs> yep. Actually, the hardest stage with babies is when they're old enough to be mobile so they can like crawl and cruise and do all these things, but they're not smart enough to understand that, nope, you shouldn't put that in your mouth. 
And yeah. I just remember being so stressed when my kids were at that age, because you have to like watch them every second. You cannot take your eyes off them because they'll just toss something in their mouth. <laughs> you, this might sound cruel, but you know what one of my favorite things about like what? your toddlers is? When they're trying to run, but they haven't figured out how to run just yet, <laughs> constantly calling. I think that's the funniest thing ever. I, I call me cruel or whatever, but it's just there's going tip 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 punk, you know. It's, <laughs> it's hilarious. It's like their legs haven't caught up yet. It's the fun, and they don't, they usually not even hurt. They just get right back up, and it's so cute. I love oh, that. they do. I mean, sometimes like my kids when they were younger, they would do like a face plant, and I would be like freaking, and they're just like, "Yep, okay, keep going." Some baby babies are almost indestructible. <laughs> it's like. I saw this video, my mom sent it to me and said it was something that I would do. And it's this little kid and he literally, he's in a Batman costume, I think. And he he's like, dad, watch me. And his dad's recording the whole thing. And he jumps down the flight of stairs. <laughs> and there's what? like 20 stairs, it's like a full flight of stairs. And he just, and it's like, it's carpeted, you know? And he's like, boom, and he crashes. And he just gets back up and he's fine, right? He just stands back up and his dad's just like, son, don't, don't ever do that again. I don't ever want to see you jump down the fly is there. That was crazy. <laughs> but it's the fun. And the kids just stand there like, I don't understand. I thought I could fly because clearly there's a towel. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just like, what is wrong with me? What's going on? Let's see. Ella says, I have to have a pencil texture brush when digitally drawing or else it doesn't feel as natural and easy to draw. And Laura says, digital is so difficult to me. The tangibility of traditional is so much easier. The disconnect between my Wacom and the screen is so frustrating. I, I That is me. Laura, I, I need the tactility of the pencil. It's just, I don't know. Like, the Apple Pencil is incredible. But I just, I need the tactility. It's so weird. Yeah, that's why I recommend getting a screen mat, like, like a screen protector. Um, something that has a bit of a texture to it because the iPad screen as it stands is very glossy. And oh, it's actually, so slippery. Like I actually started developing like small wrist issues. Um, I was like, man, I, cause I kept going like, like this and it started weighing on my wrist. So I had to make sure that I got something to stop that. And it can be tough. And to be honest with you, there's a whole class and there's a whole class in my grad school dedicated to just getting people good at drawing digitally because we spend a lot of time drawing on paper, especially in the beginning, but people still struggle with digital. And so one of my professors just said, you know, we're gonna have to develop a class specifically so people can get used to this because in the industry, they're gonna be using Wacom tablets or Cintiqs or iPads or whatever. It seems like your graduate school has like very specific focused classes. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, That's great. I, I loved it personally. I'm actually, as much as I like having my my fancy little diploma right there, uh, <laughs> I, I spent a lot of money on that piece of paper, so everyone's going to see it. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that that was part of the the way the program was structured was just having it be very very focused um, and developing skills one at a time and uh, being intentional about it because I think that's one struggle that a lot of institutions. Uh, have especially in the age of shifting, like the, you know, digital tools. Um, you could, or for example, perspective. You could teach perspective entirely differently now because of digital software and digital tools. And realistically, a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people will just use digital to do perspective stuff and do buildings and architecture. And um, things are just shifting, so it's like. You gotta keep up with the times too, on top of the intentionality behind everything. That's so funny. Did you know I just did a stream on linear perspective? <laughs> I think I did see the notification. I did see that. Yeah. Actually. I was thinking a lot about linear perspective and how usually when it's taught, it's so dry. It's like, oh my God, could we make this more boring? <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's a tough concept to understand. I remember I had a class, I, I had multiple perspective classes, but one teacher talked so quickly because the class was only like an hour and a half. And so he had to, or maybe three hours, maybe three hours. 
but he had to get through everything so quickly. And he would just, he'd be speaking like he was Eminem. Like it was ridiculous. I was like, oh my gosh. You know, he's like, okay, and we have the shadow, vanishing shadow point. I was like, bro. And, and the, the, the sad part is he spoke quickly for me. Most of the class were ESL students, English as a second language. So half of them hardly understood what he was saying. And they would oh, come no. up to me and be like, Jordan, can you explain this? <laughs> I don't know what he said. And so like, it was tough. It was tough sometimes. Oh, geez. You know, teaching people when English is not their first language, you really cannot just teach the same way. You really have to change the way you speak and how you deliver things. And I learned that over the years because there were lots of international students at RISD. And I don't know, a lot of the teachers just are not very conscious of that. It's sort of frustrating. Yeah, I, I can imagine that that would be a significant challenge, like especially for me. Um, I had a friend um, who, uh, who I met one time and it spoke a different language and we had to use Google Translate for like the first three to four months of us knowing each other. Cause like we were like, this person was really cool, but just didn't speak the language. So we had to be like, what's this word? And we had to teach each other stuff. So it became yeah. I mean, it's a good experience because then you figure out, but the thing is, it's like a lot of the teachers just kind of don't care. It's kind of terrible. Yeah, there's that too. And not a whole lot you could do about that, I guess. This is funny. Elisa says, I think it's funny that one of the best classes I've taken on perspective was a math class. I believe it. I mean, sometimes you don't have to be an artist to explain things in an accessible way. I never thought about having a perspective class in math. I mean, Maybe I hated math so much, I just didn't even notice it was there. My feeling is that, you know what? Sometimes artists are just really bad at teaching things. <laughs> like, There's that too. That could totally be a possibility. <laughs> <laughs> and Kenya says, what school did you go to? I think we're asking Jordan. I'm researching colleges for art. Since I graduate from high school soon, any recommendations for building skills and becoming the artist of my dreams? Okay, so first of all, um, art schools do not determine how well you will succeed afterwards. I just want to get that across. Um, there is no evidence that I can find that people who go to art school will have a higher chance of succeeding in art. Um, you know, there's plenty of people. One of my favorite artists didn't even go to college, and he's he's created and directing three animated shows on Netflix. So, just want to say that. Now, the school so, I went to. Hmm? That's so true, Jordan. Because people think, oh, well, if I go to this school, I will succeed. I'm like, no, <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Yeah, don't have that mindset. Um, because I thought that way. Um, I was like, oh, this person. So, so I went to RISD for undergrad. Um, and I went to the Academy of Art for grad school. Uh, at RISD, I was an illustration major, and then Academy of Art, I was a concept art for games. Uh, one of the reasons I went to RISD uh, was because the creators of Avatar went there, like realistically. I was like, if they went there and they succeeded, maybe I can be, you know, that's kind of the mindset that I had. <laughs> and in retrospect, I'm not saying that RISD was a bad choice, but that reason was not a good reason to go to school, <laughs> school there, if you, you, know, you catch the difference. Um, so if I were you, if I were in your shoes or anyone who's thinking about applying to art school, um, first off, find a program that teaches the things that you think are going to be necessary for you to succeed. Um, and look at the current student work, right? I think that's the best barometer for anything. Like you'll find some schools that show work from students from 15 years ago. No. And, and like, what's that really say about a school? Like, do you not have someone in the last 15 years who has succeeded past, you know, like what's going on with the with the classes? Um, you know, what's going on with the teachers if they're not able to produce a really solid student? The other thing is some schools um, show that same student over and over and over again. Yep. So, so maybe what the truth is, is that student would have just been brilliant on their own and they happen to go to school and they're using that to profit. But... I feel like a good art school, everyone should be really dope. You know, everyone should be almost at the same level because this, this curriculum is really amazing and blah, blah, blah. Um, 
I know I'm rambling here, but the other thing is um, pretty much it, most art schools will have a lot of students who know how to work hard. Uh, working hard is something that's very common, but sometimes the direction that they're given is what causes issues. So, you know, keep all those things in mind as you are planning your decision. I will not tell you to go to the schools I went to uh, or to avoid other schools or whatever, but uh, just be very wise about your decisions. Well, and I also think that ultimately school is about fit. And is this a good fit for you? Because oftentimes people say, oh, I want to go to the school. It's ranked number one. It's got such a good reputation. And I'm like, yeah, but did you research the major that you want to go into? Like some people will say, oh, I want to go to RISD. It's the best school. And I say, well, what do you want to do? They're like, oh, I want to do animation for Pixar. And I'm like, have you looked at their animation department? That's not really their focus. Mm -hmm. So the research is really important. Like you just can't assume based on the reputation that it's the best fit for you. Right. Cause because first of all, you never know who is, you know, I'll tell you, I'll give you a perfect example for a school, uh, for, for a statement. I was doing research and I found one of those websites like Quora, like Q-U-O-R-A or something like that. Oh, and yeah, so, yeah. And someone was talking about what art school should they go to? And um, uh, one person in it, uh, said, don't go to a school like, and they mentioned my school, Academy of Art, because blah, 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 blah. Go to a school like RISD or whatever. And then the person said, look at this person's artwork. Uh, th they're really good and they work with us. And I show my professor this comment and he's like, this is my student who I taught at the academy. Oh my God. And he works at Marvel Studios now. <laughs> it, was, it was just so ridiculous. So it was like, <laughs> how are you gonna tell them not to go to the school when they literally went to, like in the same paragraph, you know? It, so research is huge, it's huge. Um, reputation. If, if I had to give a choice between reputation and the quality of work that comes out, I would go with quality of work, like realistically. You never know what people have against a certain institution or school. Well, and also you guys, when you try to get a job, people don't usually care where you went to school. I mean, if you want to be a professor and do academia and stuff like that, yeah, they will definitely care about that. But if you're like getting hired to be a character animator at a studio, or if you're working for like a company that makes murals, they just want to know, can you do the gig? Like they don't care if you went to Pratt or SBA. Right, or if you went to college at all. <laughs> um, oh, I know. You know, there's there's people um, who are literally sophomores in college and are doing uh, freelance stuff for major networks. Um, I saw that the other day, like this 19 year old is doing design for like a Nickelodeon or Disney or something like that. And they're in college. It's like, what the heck? Like, clearly they don't care that this person's still in school <laughs> for their for them to hire the, uh, for their skills, you know? Um, oh, the New York Times doesn't care. I mean, if you do an editorial illustration, they just want to know, okay, what's your style? Does it fit my article that I'm doing? And are you a good fit? They don't care if you went to Skidmore or <laughs> you went to Yale. It doesn't matter. Right. This is a good point from Creative Girl of Color. Art school doesn't teach you how to be an entrepreneur anyway. So you're still going to be out here trying to figure it out on your own. In fact, I'm sorry to say this, but I think art school is sort of anti-entrepreneur. They, they will never say that. They will say that they're for that. But my experience, <laughs> nobody wanted me to do art prof. They, they thought I was crazy. And I got so much crap for wanting to do this. And now people are starting to come around because I think they're seeing with the pandemic, they're, oh, there actually is a use for this. But I, I don't know, I did, I did not feel supported. Like people were mad at me that I wasn't doing the stereotypical professor life. Yeah, there's, there's, here's the thing, no matter what school you go to, a lot of the stuff you're gonna have to learn on your own because, um, you know, it's just like when you're trying to build a four year curriculum, most of the time they're going to say, how do we give you the skills that are necessary to, you know, compete? There's no, there's very little time spent on how to deal with contracts or putting together a resume. Usually it's just one class at like in your last semester or something. Um, or 
job interviews, which I'm not saying is a terrible thing, but those skills are just as important, if not more, um, because you could have really good skills and still not get hired. Then you're really stuck. Uh, and I know some people who are in that situation uh, and it's just it's just kind of how it is sometimes. Also, I think it's a mistake for those professional development classes to be the last semester of your senior year. Because it's too late at that point. Right. Like, I think people should have a website up junior year. Like, it shouldn't have to be perfect, but you should have at least like the first draft because a website is ongoing. It's not something you just do and then are done with it forever. Like, you're having to update it. You got to change it. And I think that people should have professional development first semester junior year. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing too that's just made me think about was um, a lot of students will feel as if they have to wait before they can put something out like there's this subtle uh expectation that your teachers have to approve everything before you way to put yourself out there and maybe you do need some skill development or whatever but sometimes you just need to go for it and um i find that if you at least do that, then there will be fewer regrets that way. You know, like if if I want to apply to a specific network or a specific studio, and my teacher's like, "Oh, you probably not probably won't get that or something because your skills aren't there," let the company tell you no. They yeah, no position, but let them tell you no. Well, that's actually the mindset we take here at Art Prof because Jordan, when I first started. I mean, you were an intern at the very beginning, but you weren't doing the TA stuff until later on. So when we first started, I had this very like curated vision, like everything we put out had to be perfect, had to be like the best. But the thing is like that held us back in the beginning because we released so little content that we didn't learn from it very fast. But now we just spit out content and yeah, a lot of it's not good, but some of it is. And I feel like we learn more. I think so. I think that's what mistakes are all about. Like even today, like I'm not like these drawings I'm doing today. I don't feel any particular way about. Them. I'm like, uh, eh, it could be better. Maybe if I had warmed up an hour before or something. But I'm just not on fire today, and that's fine, you know. And I'm technically embarrassing myself in front of hundreds of other people. Well, it's just it is what it is. They're sketches, and uh, who cares? <laughs> As long as you guys are you know what? Jordan, from a sketching point of view, people have to see that you're not perfect a thousand percent of the time, right? Oh, totally. Because I think it's intimidating when someone is, you know, just flawless, you know. Even even Prince had his off days, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> Alex says. Then again, most schools in America and in general don't support doing freelance and entrepreneurship. It depends on the school because I know when I was teaching at RISD, people talked about freelance as like the ultimate goal. Freelance is the greatest lifestyle. And I'm like, it is for some people, but not for everybody. <laughs> yeah, freelance drives me crazy personally. I, I mean, I do it, I do it, but if I had a choice, I would much rather have something a little bit more steady than uh, than just freelance. Uh, Kristen says, I got so stressed out in art school because I was so worried about creating a body of work that I was afraid to make mistakes or be experimental. Yeah, I mean, art school, that that's the place to mess up and try stuff and fall on your face because when you start working professionally, there's fewer and fewer opportunities to do that because you're just busy doing other things. And Mark says, I think the education system fails to give students tools on how to navigate the industry or just real life. Some may give or have it on the curriculum, but it's not as in-depth or it's lacking. I'm sorry to say, I'm gonna throw some shade here. It's half of it is the professor's fault. A lot of them are just horribly out of date or they look down on like, oh, social media, that's beneath me. And I'm like, guess what? That's what everybody's using. You better get up to date. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think every artist has to learn to make their own decisions at a certain point. Um, and 
assuming you have a good professor, you know, obviously the bad ones, we could, you know, there's not really much we need to talk about them, but that's kind of what your, your network is for. Um, I actually don't even like the term networking because it almost assumes like you're going to, you want something out of somebody rather than just being yeah. and helping you out. You know, like people say you should go to conventions and network and like, yeah, true. You should. But people can always sense when you're like, Hey, I'll be your friend because I believe you can get me jobs. And I don't think that's the first way people should approach it. It should be build a relationship. And then, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch yours type of thing. Uh, and if you have a good relationship with a professor or a friend of yours, you never know what situation you're going to be in, which is another reason why I think you should always be nice to people. You, <laughs> you, never know, you never know when someone is going to end up being a director and you're applying for their project or whatever. You never know. Yeah, it's like you can't force those connections. It's like you connect to somebody or you don't. It's not a lot you can do to control that, I guess. Right. Because you know something, Jordan, I had the same thing in grad school. So in grad school, I went to grad school in New York. You know, there's all these like hotshot artists who are there. And there was a critic there who was one of those like, ooh, she, she, New York City art gallery artists. And I thought, okay, I should connect with her. At the time, I really wanted to do that route. But it's like, I had this really frustrating studio visit with this artist. And I just felt like they weren't listening to me and they were just so into themselves. And afterwards I was like, I don't want to connect with you. You're just not that fun to talk to. Right. Yeah, I, I totally understand that. I totally understand that. Yeah, and people... actually you guys, we're doing a double header today. I don't know if you knew this, but we are premiering this tutorial with my colleague Kathy Speranza. She's gonna show you guys in the tutorial how she draws roses and charcoal and pencil drawing. And it's like Kathy and I, because we get along, we were able to do that tutorial together and we had a great time. I think you guys are gonna really love it. But it's like I couldn't do that with anybody. It had to be with somebody who I like had a connection to. Yeah, gotta make those gotta make those art friends. You never know. You just never know. Well, and it should be easy when you connect with somebody. It, it shouldn't feel like you're pulling teeth or anything. Right. It's just like the same way anyone will make a friend. You know that that's how I see it. And just like be friendly, be be nice, and maybe crack a joke or two, and you know, hopefully you have something in common. Um, and that's that. <laughs> Oh, let's see. Some people are asking about my brush. And yes, it is a Sumi brush. It's a brush that you use for Chinese brush painting. I don't like the typical watercolor brushes that you get at the art store. I feel like they're a little bit stiff. And what I like about these is with a brush like this, I can make like a super broad stroke, but then the tip is so fine that you can make like really, really tiny strokes. Like these little strokes I'm doing down here in the grass are really, really fine. And it's easy to do with the Sumi brush. So yeah, I, I just, I don't know. I don't like the watercolor brushes. They're too, they're, the, this shape is too determined. Like if you have a brush that's more square shape, I feel like it makes a square stroke. This doesn't necessarily do that. That This can make any stroke you want. And oh, Deep D's in the chat. How cool. Deep 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 Deep. Artist, in case you guys didn't know. Deep D saying, do you use the same brush for the whole painting or have thinner brushes for details? Honestly, I'm good with this <laughs> one brush. I know some people have like 500 brushes, but I get confused if there's too many brushes. I mean, if I'm doing like a big painting, I might have like a second brush for like big strokes. But for a painting this size, this is really totally good enough. Uh, Shaim says, do you guys ever feel embarrassed when you don't remember someone that remembers you? <laughs> Have you done that, Jordan? Yes. Um, but the thing is, I, 
I try not to get embarrassed. I just try and be upfront and just be like, look, I straight up, I straight, I just don't remember you. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> like I, I, there are times when I recognize someone, but I don't remember their name and I'll do everything I can to just not be in a position to have to say their name. And, uh, you know, I remember I, one time I forgot my professor's name um, when I was, <laughs> I, I visited my high school after a year to see the underclassmen graduate. And I had a whole 20 minute conversation with my professor and my girlfriend was there at the time and she was like, or I asked her, I was like, what's her name again? She's like, dude, really? <laughs> you had, you were a student. <laughs> oh my God. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> so Shaim, that's basically me anytime I see a student. Cause I would be walking on RISD and people would be like, Claire, I'm like, I don't know who you are. <laughs> so terrible like my rule now well I'm not teaching in the classroom anymore but when I did I said to students up front I was like listen I will remember you and your name for this semester okay that I will work very hard to make sure that happens but after that you either have to be extremely spectacular memorable for some really awkward reason or just spectacularly terrible as a student I only remember the extremes <laughs> Yeah, to be fair, I only remember the extremes from from your class too. <laughs> like in terms of the students, <laughs> there are some extreme situations. I was like, whoa, and all the ones that were kind of, eh, I don't, I have no idea. <laughs> well, you know, and after a while, students were like, "What can I do to get you to remember me?" I'm like, I don't know that you want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> That's not always a good thing. All right, guys, Jordan and I will be hanging out in the Art Prof Discord. We will be in the Art Alongs channel. The invite link is in the video description below. Subscribe to our YouTube channel so you guys can continue to grow and develop as an artist. And everybody, thank you so much to our top Patreon supporters for helping us keep Art Prof 100% free and accessible to everybody. And don't forget, we have this tutorial premiere tonight at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Kathy and I will both be live in the chat. It's an hour long tutorial, so you guys better grab that popcorn, <laughs> get comfortable. We're gonna talk about drawing and charcoal and pencil. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.